good morning once again to our church at home folks. We're so thankful that you've allowed us into your home again for our church at home. We're really glad that we've been able to continue to do this. I know there are many of you that are not comfortable yet coming back to church and uh, others that just enjoy uh, being able to watch the message, keep up with what's going on at Gateway, and so we're glad to be able to continue to do this for a while. Uh, I mentioned a couple of things last week, a couple of outreach opportunities that we have through the holidays that everybody can participate in. So I want to remind you just briefly of those again. Uh, we need names of people in, in our community that are either shut in or ill, or maybe people in your neighborhood that you are reaching out to. And we would like to deliver to them on November 22nd, that's a Sunday night, a beautiful Thanksgiving dinner. And so if you can think of somebody like that, we'd like for you to call the church office and give us their name and their address, and we will make sure that gets delivered. Or if you are able to make that delivery, that would be even better. You could come pick it up at the church from four to six, make that delivery, or we'll have someone else make that delivery. But call the church office, give us those names, 837-8087. And so that's how you can do that. And then also don't forget our Christmas with Dignity store this year is on December 5th. And so that only gives us just a few weeks, just a couple of weeks really, to get you to donate toys. And so you can donate new toys, unopened toys, and those are going to be sold literally at pennies on the dollar. Uh, and, and folks will be able to come and, and buy gifts for their children that they pick out with their own money and be able to do that. And so great outreach opportunities. I hope that you'll get involved in, in both of those. Hey, today, guess what? We are on the sixth of seven of our Plum Line series. Only one left after this, and then we'll begin uh, talking about Christmas. And so we are really moving forward, but really excited about finishing out this series and just seeing those, those important things, those values that we embrace as a church and as God's people. So looking forward to worshiping today with you guys and opening God's Word in a few minutes. So let's bow together in prayer, and then we'll get started. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for giving us time um, right now just to set everything aside, Lord, and to sing praises to you, and Lord, to open your Word, and to be encouraged and to be challenged. And Lord, I pray today that uh, as we do open your word, that we will be challenged, Lord, to be uh, people of love, people that reflect uh, Jesus Christ in everything that we do, and that a community around us, uh, through our love, would would see the Lord Jesus. And so, uh, Father, we give you this time today, and you know, thank you for every person that's watching right now. Lord, I don't know all the needs, I don't know all the problems, I don't know all the struggles, but you do. And so, as Father, uh, people are watching Today, Lord, just encourage them by your spirit. Um, Lord, meet the needs that they have uh, by your power and by your grace. We ask these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you guys ready to sing? All right, let's do it. I know that it is finished. 
Christ in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I give?
Over 30 years ago, a man named Steve Sjogren in Cincinnati, Ohio, planted a church with 37 people. And he simply challenged that little group of people to go out into their community and to demonstrate the love and gospel of Jesus by doing simple, random acts of love, things that cared for the people in their community. And so this little group of people made a choice that they were going to bless others. Well, that little church grew over the course of the next couple of decades to over 7,000 in attendance. Steve later wrote a book called Conspiracy of Kindness, built around the concept of actively loving others and the difference that it makes as we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that leads us to the sixth plumb line of seven in our series called Plumb Lines. And if you are a member of Gateway, you know that uh, plumb lines are simply short biblical statements that we believe summarize the values of our church. It's what we're all about. It's how we know that we're on the right track. And so today, our, our plumb line is simply this. Love on display is our most convincing witness. You know, guys, our community can't see Jesus with their eyes, right? He's not here on earth anymore physically for people to see. They can't watch him love people, heal people. They can't hear him teach like people in Jesus' day could, but they can certainly see us. They can see God's people. And in a very real way, we are painting Jesus with our lives so that our community can see him and what he is like. And guys, we do that. Now listen, we do that with our love. We do it with our love. In fact, the Bible says that love is our defining characteristic. In 1 John 4, 7 and 8, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. It is a defining characteristic of the believer. There is a kind of love that comes out of us because we are connected to Jesus. In John chapter 15, Jesus said he was the vine and we are the branches. And as we are connected to him, we're drawing life from him. And if we're connected to him, then there is a love from him flowing into us and out to others. And my prayer today is that we're going to learn what it means to express love to others and that our Heavenly Father would use it to point others to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I chose Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12 as our passage today. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. This is the golden rule. It's one of the many passages that express this idea of active love that God's people ought to be about. So Matthew 7 verse 12, let's just read it. It says, Therefore, Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And believe it or not, the golden rule was not a new concept when Jesus spoke it here in the book of Matthew. In fact, it had been around a long time, but it had always before been stated in a negative way or in a negative form. In other words, don't do anything that you wouldn't want someone to to do to you. Don't hurt others, right? Whatever is hateful to you, don't do that to them. That's the way it had always been stated by others. That was the idea. But the uniqueness here is that Jesus flips it around and he states it in a positive way. He says, the way that you want people to treat you, then treat them that way. So to follow Christ in this is not just staying out of trouble or keeping away from doing bad or trying not to hurt others, but it is actively living out the love of Christ in intentional ways. And so to the church today, one of the greatest witnesses that we have is to live our lives this way, to be full of love, to put that on full display for all to see. Now today what I want to do is I want to look at some truths about living this life of love, okay, and then we're going to talk about this as, as a plumb line in our church. So here we go. You ready? Living a life of love, number one, it impacts how others treat you. It impacts how others treat you. If you were to translate this from the original Greek, it would read, in everything, the way you want to be treated, so treat others this way. So how do you want others to treat you? Well, this is impacted by what you do and by how you treat others. 
Do you want to be forgiven when you stumble? When you need affirmation, do you want to be affirmed and encouraged? Do you want unconditional love in your life? Do you want to be treated with kindness? What is it that you want from others? Well, whatever it is, Jesus said, that's what you need to learn to give. You know, we uh, we say things like this, uh, you're going to reap what you sow. Have you ever said that? You'll reap what you sow. What goes around comes around, right? And usually when we say those kind of things, we're saying it like in a negative way. Like you're going to get yours. You did this. Now you're going to get yours on the other end. But the opposite of that is also true in that if we send out love and grace and, and mercy and help, those things will come back to you. In fact, Ecclesiastes 11 1 says, cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. It's a way of saying when you send it out, right? It has a way of coming home. So how do you want people to treat you in the days ahead? Your spouse, your children, your coworkers, your neighbors, people at Walmart, people that you encounter day in and day out. You, by your actions, have the ability to affect that. If you want forgiveness, forgive. If you want affirmation, affirm and encourage other people people. If you want to be loved, love. If you want kindness, be what? Be kind, right? You know, mama always says, if you want a friend, you got to what? You got to be a friend. There's a lot of truth, right? In that old saying, most of the time, what you cast out comes home. That's just true. That's just truth. Now, Jesus also here, I think if we look at it, he's also teaching us to take the initiative in this. In other words, we shouldn't wait for others to be kind and loving, and then we decide to be kind and loving, right? Jesus indicates that we should be willing to act in love before they do to take the initiative. So let me just ask you, as we begin here, right now, what is it that's been coming back to you? Um, Chances are, now not always, but chances are that whatever is coming back to you are the things that you have sown. Living a life of love impacts how others treat you. So that's the first idea. And the second idea, living a life of love, demands that you act. It demands that you act. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, clearly we are being called on here to take the lead. And that requires action. You know, to to simply keep from hurting others, you really don't have to do anything, right? You just just don't hurt others. You can do that sitting at home knitting, right? Not hurt others. You can accomplish that. However, again, Jesus here stated it in a positive way that requires action on our behalf in order to obey. This statement is not passive in the least. You can't be lazy and self-centered and fulfill the golden rule. So let's take a look at how we can be kind and loving. And I want to give you some ideas. And and I just want to tell you, they all start with G. All right. Now, um, how can we live a life of love? This should be easy to take notes. All right. Four things. Be gracious to others. First of all, be gracious to others. Extend grace to others. Could we agree on the fact today that nobody's perfect? That we all make mistakes. You know, many times somebody in our life, perhaps they deserve to have the book thrown at them, right? They've done something, they've hurt us, whatever, and and they deserve to have the book thrown at them, and we can't wait to do it when instead, as Christ followers, we ought to be extending to that person grace. You know, very often we keep a record of wrongs, don't we? And we really ought to be tearing that record of wrongs up. 1 Corinthians 13, 5, and that's the love chapter, right? It says that love thinks no evil. And literally what that means is that it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. And you know, grace, receiving grace is what we all have been given in Christ Jesus. Giving grace to others makes us more like Jesus. Graciousness overlooks the faults of others. Listen, there aren't many people, guys, in the world today that live this way, that live grace-filled lives. If you want to stand out, if you want an opportunity to look like Jesus in a world that doesn't, man, be a grace giver. Cut, Cut folks some slack. Don't give them what they deserve. Don't keep a record of their wrongs. Proverbs 17, 9 is an incredible passage to take a look at here. And let me just read this to you. Proverbs 17, 9. It says, He who covers a transgression seeks love, 
But he who repeats a matter separates friends. Giving grace protects another person. You know, just because you know something doesn't mean that you ought to share it. You should be wanting to protect others. Proverbs 19 and verse 11 uh, also speaks to this. The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger and his glory is to overlook a transgression. Do you have dirt on somebody? You know something about somebody? Grace says it is to your glory to keep your mouth shut. It's to your glory to overlook that transgression. The Bible also says that it is love that covers over a multitude of sins. And guys, last I checked, your sins in Christ have been covered over. So be gracious. Second thing, show gratitude. Show gratitude. This is a way to follow the golden rule and to love others. Jesus modeled gratitude for us, didn't he? Even before he did that great miracle of feeding 5,000, right? With the loaves and fishes. He stopped everything and he acknowledged his heavenly father and he did what? He gave thanks. And you know, God loves grateful hearts and truly we love grateful hearts too, right? If you do something nice, for somebody and you don't get any thanks, it hurts your feelings, right? It does. They didn't even say thank you, right? However, we love to hear words of gratitude. We love it when people uh, remember what we did. It makes us feel good. It encourages us. You know, after Fort Tipton Day, we got some incredible notes of, of gratitude and thanksgiving from pastors and teachers and schools expressing gratitude for the things that we were able to do that day. Uh, people giving gratitude, and we love to receive gratitude. Giving it is a way to love others. We ought to be gracious people. I read a story this week about a little boy who was infatuated with the the men that that picked up the garbage at their house every day. In fact, he was so enthralled and so thankful for what they did that, that Many days he would go out with a cooler full of water and drinks, and when they'd come by, he'd stop and he'd, he'd talk to them and he'd give them drinks and he'd thank them for what they did. And I just want you guys to know our culture is losing that kind of thing right now. Why do you think it meant so much for people to get a handwritten note at Fort Tipton Day? Because it never happens anymore. Nobody does that anymore. We don't express thanks very well. Colossians 2 7, however, tells us that we ought to abound in thanksgiving. Gratitude ought to be something that we abound in, all right? Number three, third thing, be gentle. Be gentle. Do you have anybody in your life that's not gentle? Maybe they snap at everybody around them. Maybe they're always in a hurry. Perhaps they are a little rough with their language, or maybe they don't really want you around them, and they make that clear. They're just kind of a bull in a china shop relationally. And you guys... Stop looking at your spouses and all that, all right? But you might have somebody in your life that's not gentle. And the truth of the matter is, we don't like it when people are harsh and grumpy toward us. And Jesus here is saying to us, if you don't want that to come back to you, then don't send it out. Don't be that way. Now listen, Jesus was gentle. And and not that he wasn't a man's man. I certainly believe that Jesus was. But many times you see Jesus And the little children, man, they're climbing up in his lap, right? They knew that he was gentle. He always seemed to be around sinners and the poor and the desperate. And they found him as well to be gentle and loving. In fact, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where we've been this morning already, the first person Jesus encounters is a leper, an outcast. And yet Jesus welcomes him and accepts him in gentleness. Matthew 11, 29, uh, 28 and 29 28 says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. And then verse 29 says, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly of heart. Philippians 4, 5 tells us, he says, let your gentleness be known to all men. He's saying, let your gentleness be seen by others. Live this way so that others can see it. There's a result in doing that. And we're going to talk about that when we get to the end. So we need to be gentle. And then fourthly, a way to to show this kind of love is be generous. Be generous. So often when it comes to being generous, we only do the minimum, right, of what is expected. Am I right about that? What's the least I can do and still appear generous? What's the lowest tip I can give 
and still and it still be acceptable, right? I heard a story this week uh, actually took place a number of years ago, but the governor of Kentucky had attended a public event. It was a day long event, and they were serving dinner at this event. And so, at the end of the day, the governor, after most everybody's been fed, he gets in the line to uh, to go through and get his food. And so he gets down to the end of the line to where the lady is putting the chicken on the plate and she puts one piece of chicken on his plate. And he says to her, ma'am, it's been a long day and I'm really hungry. Is there any way you could give me one extra piece of chicken? She says, one piece of chicken per person. So he looks over into the bucket and there's a lot of chicken. And he looks back behind him and there's nobody behind him in line. He says, ma'am, uh, again, it's been a long day and, I, and I'm really hungry. You have plenty of chicken, it looks like, and there's, there's nobody behind me. Is there any way I can just have one more piece of chicken? And she says, I said one piece of chicken per person. And finally, he says, he says, ma'am, I'm the governor of the state of Kentucky. And she looks up at him and she says, I'm the person that decides about the chicken. Now, you might know somebody like that, right? You might know the chicken lady, right? Only the minimum will do. I got to stick to the rules, man. Where's the generosity, right, in today's world? First Timothy 6.18, without reading, it says, those that have stuff, you ought to be ready to share. So why should we be generous, right? The quick answer is, is because Jesus is generous. Do you remember the parable that Jesus told about a landowner who went out to hire workers to do a job? And if you remember the parable, the landowner hired some people early in the day. He hired others in the middle of the day, and he hired some toward the end of the day so that he could get the job finished. But at the end of the day, they all got paid the same amount of money. And so those that were hired early in the day complained about this because it didn't seem right to them. But then in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 15, that landowner who represents God in the parable, by the way, says to them, he says, is your eye envious because I am generous? God says, I am a generous God. God is a giver and he is generous. And if we are going to follow him and we are going to follow the golden rule, if we're going to send out love in this way, then we have to be generous. The truth of the matter is that the whole context back in the Sermon on the Mount, if you go back and look at it, the whole context is built around the fact that God himself loves to give good and generous gifts to his children. That's the whole context of the statement. And I thought, what better time of year than right now, right, to be generous people. We're right here at Thanksgiving and Christmas. We've got a dinner coming up. We've got Christmas with Dignity. And guys, we have missionaries that are going to be with us. There are church planners, our mission partners, people in your life that you know about that you can be generous with. So we need to love by our generosity. Guys, it comes back to you. I, I believe that with all of my heart. There's some verses. Uh, if we want to look them up, we can here. Proverbs 11 and verse 25 says, The generous soul will be made rich. And he who waters will also be watered himself. Uh, flip over to Proverbs 19 and verse 6. Proverbs 19 and verse 6. It says a similar thing. It says, many entreat the favor of nobility and every man is a friend to one who gives gifts. And then Proverbs 22 and verse 9, very similar uh, message here. It says, he who has a generous eye will be blessed for he gives up his bread to the poor. And we literally could read on and on uh, and read verses like that. Now, we go back to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. There's a phrase at the end of that verse that's important. At the end of all this, Jesus says, for this, right, the golden rule, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, this is where the golden rule, as stated in the book of Matthew by Jesus, it's really different from any other version. Jesus' interpretation of the golden rule, guys, is grounded firmly in the love of God. You remember where Jesus said in another place, the first and the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. On these two things hang the law and the prophets. 
See, guys, this isn't just a wise way to live, but we love this way because it is rooted and grounded in our relationship with God. The law and the prophets, all of that are fulfilled in these words, love God and love your neighbor, right? These are the greatest commandments. This is what Jesus said. And so God's people, you and I living this way, is rooted in that relationship with God. As we say, God, I want to love because I know that it is honoring to you because of my relationship with you, because of Christ in me, I want to love. We live this way out of a love that we have for God, yes, but it is really rooted in the love that he has for us. See, we love because he first loved us, because he has loved us. You say, well, okay, why is this a plumb line for our church? Why is this something that, that, that we talk about as a plumb line? Well, I want you to listen to this logic with me, if you will, for a moment. If, if our task is to make disciples, and it is. If if we are to make followers of Jesus, and the second greatest command is to love our neighbors, right? And the mark, according to Jesus, that identifies us as his followers is loving one another, then it makes perfect sense that love, putting love on display, would be our greatest witness to a lost world. We can paint Jesus, if you will, by being filled with love, by being gracious, by being full of gratitude, by being gentle and kind, and by being being generous in every way. Honestly, church, that's why we do things like Fort Tipton Day. It's why we try to help out in our schools. It's why we try to help our community to, to paint Jesus for all to see. Now, Guys, kindness and love by itself is never enough. It always has to be joined to the truth of the gospel, right? Listen, listen close. Truth, truth without grace and love is fundamentalism and it pushes people away. However, on the other side of things, grace and kindness without truth is just sentimentality and it's useless. If we have one of those without the other, if we have truth without love or we have love without truth and we are impeding the progress of the gospel, however, when those two things are united, there is great power for the church. And so in that way, when we hold on to the truth, it's possible to love somebody to Jesus. I read this week about a church that had a small group of men And they met every week, but they also attended a gym. They worked out together as well. There was a man named Mike who also went to that gym. He was a very friendly young man, but he was very antagonistic toward religion, toward their faith, toward the gospel. So he told these young men that he thought their belief system was a fairy tale and that the only reason that they believed was because they needed something to help them cope with life, and yet Knowing all these things about Mike, they befriended him, they prayed for him, they invited him to church over and over again. He politely declined every single time. A few months later, however, Mike developed a very serious medical condition and was admitted to the hospital. And although his condition was a a treatable condition, the treatment was very expensive. Mike did not have health insurance at the time, and so this group of young men raised money over $2,000 to pay for Mike's hospital stay. Now, Mike, who didn't have a lot of family, he was overwhelmed by their generosity. And he said, why are you doing this? And they answered, because we serve a Savior who gave up everything for us. And we didn't care anything about him. About three months later, Mike made a profession of faith in Christ and was baptized at that church. Guys, listen, love on display is our most convincing witness. Hear this, church. The days are largely over when people outside of Christ will walk into our churches and want to hear the message just because we're here. The drug addict, the homosexual, 
the skeptical student, the, the nuns, right, in, in our world are not showing up at our churches because we put on such a fine show. In reality, the only way to reach these kinds of people will be through radical demonstrations of love, grace, gratitude, gentleness, and generosity that cannot be understood apart from Christ. Perhaps if they can see Jesus in us, we will have the opportunity and the platform then to explain what He has done for them and their sins too can be washed away. A love on display Painting Jesus for all to see with our love is our most convincing witness. Will you guys pray with me, please? Father, thank you again for time together with these uh, precious people that are watching today. Lord, I thank you that uh, that they have been faithful to tune in and to keep up and and Lord, to uh, continue to grow in their faith, continue to, to want to hear the word of God taught and proclaimed and, and to worship. And Father, I pray that today that we've been challenged and encouraged uh, by your word. And Lord, I pray that you would open doors of love and, and grace and, and mercy in our lives that we might paint Christ, that others might see who he is, might see his love, and in turn might hear and understand the gospel that they might be saved. And so, Father, we ask that you would help us to, to love like you love, to care like you care, uh, that others might see Christ in us. And we ask these things today in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, guys, again, thank you so much for allowing us back into your home. If you're a guest with us, uh, you would do something for us. Text HELLO, H-E-L-L-O, to 329-7929. That way you'll, we'll know that you watched we can follow up with you. We'd love to do that. If there's some kind of decision that you need to make, if the Lord is working in your life and you need to talk to somebody about it, if you want to come to faith in Christ, and man, you just want somebody to work through that with, please call us. Our church office, 837-8087. You can email any of our staff. That's just our first name, uh, at gatewaytipton.com. And we would love to um, speak with you, love to relate to you in any way that we can. So again, love you guys. Um, hope everybody's doing well, feeling well. Uh, I know there's a little bit of an uptick in uh, coronavirus cases around, so everybody be careful. And we just want you to know we, we love you. Let us know if you need anything. We'll talk to you soon. Music.